practice makes perfect. Chapter 28 The door slid open. The children dashed through. They found themselves in a warm, bright room that smelled heavily of newsprint and ink. It seemed to be some kind of press office. Two tables stacked with printed material stretched across the middle of the room, and in the far corner an oversized printer was spitting out page after page. A television stood near the printer, its screen flashing but the volume turned down, and on top of it sat a glass of juice. The room appeared to be in the process of being disassembled. Two long tables had been folded up and leaned vertically against one wall, several empty wooden crates were stacked against the other. This was clearly a busy place, and only temporarily empty. Mr. Curtin rolled into the room twenty seconds later carrying a tall stack of newspapers in his lap. Empty was how the room appeared to him, too. Humming a chipper tune, Mr. Curtin shot over to the printer and began sorting through the printouts. Meanwhile, the entire membership of the mysterious Benedict Society, crammed inside an empty crate like a bunch of discarded dolls, peered out through the spaces between the crate's wooden slats. Rainy, because of the unfortunate angle of his neck and the weight of Constance upon it, was only able to see a bit of floor. Constance's view of the ceiling was little better. Sticky, however, was in the perfect position to see the evidence of the unfortunate thing that had just happened, and by pinching Kate's ankle to get her attention, then repeatedly blinking and rolling his eyes, he tried to explain it to her. His eyes, white as saucers, seemed to Kate more anxious and panicky than usual. This was understandable, she thought, given their predicament. Although, wasn't something missing? Something about his eyes? And was he trying to point something out to her? Kate swiveled her own eyes to see what Sticky was looking at. There, in plain sight on the floor outside the crate, were his spectacles. They must have come loose when Kate tossed him into the crate. She hadn't seen them fall, she was too busy throwing Constance over her shoulder, tumbling in after the boys, and pulling the top of the crate over them. But she saw them now, all right. And if Mr. Curtin hadn't been absorbed in his newspapers when he came in, he would have spotted them, too. But the moment he finished his task at the printer and turned around, Kate could tell the spectacles were beyond her reach. She would need to consult her bucket. This proved a bit tricky, though, one arm she could not move at all, the other she had to thread around Constance's neck while pressing her elbow into sticky snows, and she had to bend her wrist backward at an unnatural angle that hurt like the Dickens. A bit tricky, yes, but Kate managed it, and with a sharp tug, which brought tears to sticky size, she had her horseshoe magnet. The spectacles had wire rims. Kate just hoped it was the proper kind of wire. Mr. Curtin had turned the volume up on the television. A news anchor was saying something about the emergency. Mr. Curtin giggled, actually giggled, as if he were watching a comedy show. He sipped his juice and returned to his work, humming again. From her awkward angle inside the crate, Kate could see Mr. Curtin's wheels pointed toward the printer. Now was the time. She slipped her arm between two crate slats and stretched it out as far as she could. The magnet was still a few inches short of the spectacles. Gripping it as tightly as she could between two fingers, Kate stretched just a tiny bit further. The spectacles twitched. Then quivered. Then slid over to meet the magnet with a click. Mr. Curtin's humming stopped. Hey! Who's there? With a sharp squeak, the wheels whipped about to face the crate, into which Kate, a split second before, had drawn the spectacles. There was a long pause, a tap-tap-tapping of fingers on a hard surface, and finally a grunt. The wheels turned away. A few minutes later Mr. Curtin had left the room. The children piled out of the crate, stretching their stiff limbs and rubbing their bruises. Rainy looked quickly about. He took his juice, so maybe he's not coming back. Constance, will you stand guard? You know the code, if you hear someone coming, run in and warn us. He ushered her out the door before she could think to argue. Sticky was already going through a stack of fresh printouts. These are government press releases. What's a press release? Kate asked, 
looking over his shoulder. A kind of report sent to the newspapers to be printed, Sticky said. He scratched his head. Strange, these are all dated from the future. One's from next week, one's from the week after, and so on for months, even years. They're planned press releases, Rainey said, coming over to flip through the pile. Articles Mr. Curtin intends to have printed in the newspapers. And they all have something to do with him. Look at the headline on this one for next week. Esteemed scientist and educator appointed to important post. Sticky groaned and took off his spectacles. Will you read it aloud, Rainy? I'm afraid I need to polish these. And so Rainy read aloud. Le drop the curtain, the recently named Minister and Secretary of all the Earth's regions, M-A-S-T-E-R, had this to say about his new role. The governments of the world have established my position as that of an advisor and coordinator in this time of crisis. Being a private man, I accept the honor reluctantly, believing it my duty. That's preposterous, Kate said. There's no such position. Apparently there will be. It says here that the governments have finally reorganized themselves in response to the emergency. Sticky spluttered but the emergency is made up, it's something Mr. Curtin created. I can't believe every single. That's it. Rainey cried, staring intently at the paper. He felt a wave of relief, quickly followed by alarm, as if he'd finally succeeded in translating hieroglyphics only to discover he'd translated a curse. What's it, Rainey? asked Kate. The emergency is the first step, Rainey said, thumping the paper. Mr. Curtin thinks fear is the most important element in human personality, remember? It's why the whisperer has so much appeal to messengers, it soothes their fears, and Mr. Curtin uses that to motivate them. So what if he created a fear, a fear everyone would hold in common, a fear the entire public would share? The fear that everything is hopelessly out of control, Kate said. Exactly. Then his next step would be to soothe that fear with just the right message. The messengers all love the whisperer with a passion, right? Well, Mr. Curtin intends to make it so that everyone in the world will feel the way messengers do. Everyone will love the whisperer? Sticky said. No, Rainy said. Everyone will love him. Rainy was putting it all together now. So those journal entries, the places where he seemed to be talking to himself, trust Le Drop the Curtain, and all that. They were rough drafts. He's working on his new message, Sticky said, finally understanding. Kate couldn't help but laugh. You mean Le Drop the Curtain stops the Hutton was an idea for a hidden message? That's so lame. Rainey handed another press release to Kate. Look at this one. Curtain best man, T.O. Handle baffling amnesia epidemic. An amnesia epidemic? Sticky said. Kate had moved down the table to rifle through a stack of pamphlets, shaking her head in disgust. And here's how he intends to pull it off. She handed each boy a pamphlet. Reluctantly, Sticky put his glasses back on, and in grim silence, they all read the pamphlet. It was an official advisory from something called the Public Health Administration. Just what is sudden amnesia disease, sad? SAD is an extremely contagious disease that causes total memory loss in those who contract it. What's being done about it? Although the origin and cure of this disease have yet to be found, they're being investigated by a group of experts headed by none other than Le Drop the Curtain, the highly regarded scientist and our newly named Minister and Secretary of all the Earth's regions. SAD cases are admitted for free care at the Amnesia Sanctuary on Nomansan Island, a state-of-the-art facility where patients live comfortably, under strict quarantine, while the cure for their disease is sought. A.M. slash a sad case? Are my neighbors? A common first symptom of sad is the belief that one hears children's voices in one's head. The onset of this symptom is most sudden, and once it has begun, it persists without interruption until amnesia sets in. Rainy flipped to the next page which showed a picture of two smiling recruiters. They had their hands on the shoulders of Jackson the executive, 
who was trying his best to look miserable and happy at the same time. The photo caption read, Already feeling better. A sad case jokes around with our friendly doctors. Sticky had finished the pamphlet and hurried to the other table. There are more over here, printed in dozens of languages. I can't believe it, Kate said. It doesn't make sense. For Rainy it all made too much sense. The last piece of the puzzle had fallen into place. This whole thing, he said bleakly, the helpers, the recruiters, the messengers, the entire institute, it's all been one big experiment to make sure his plan can work. Mr. Curtin has been practicing. The institute will become the amnesia sanctuary, he needs a place to put all the people who resist him. People like us, said Kate. People including us, said Sticky.